Hassan and colleagues described a ventricular tachycardia responding to verapamil unlike the usual ventricular tachycardias which respond to lignocaine. It may be noted that verapamil is conventionally a drug used for treatment of supraventricular rather than ventricular tachycardia. Even though other authors had reported on VT with relatively narrow QRS complex originating from the posterior fascicle, it was Belhassen and colleagues who suggested this form of VT as a separate entity. 12 lead ECG of idiopathic vesicular ventricular tachycardia showing classical right bundle branch block pattern with left axis morphology suggestive of posterior vesicular origin. Classical ECG pattern in Belhassen's VT is right bundle branch block pattern with left axis deviation as it originates from the left posterior vesicle. Tachycardia originating from the left anterior vesicle has RBB pattern with right axis deviation and that originating from left septal fascicle has RBB pattern with normal axis. Though intravenous verapamil is useful for termination of the tachycardia, success in prophylaxis is variable. Some cases respond to oral propranolol prophylaxis. Radio frequency catheter ablation is a good option for Belhassen's VT with good success rates being reported. Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is a potentially life threatening cardiac channelopathy with propensity for polymorphic, typically bidirectional ventricular tachycardia with exercise or emotional stress. Various genotypes of CPVT have been described ranging from CPVT1 to CPVT5 as per the online Mendelian Inheritance in Man database. The first one to be described was CPVT1 with mutation in cardiac cryonodin receptor. A review on CPVT was published by us in Heart Rhythm in 2005. The gene responsible for CPVT1 is located on chromosome 1. It is a mutation in the cardiac cryonodin receptor gene. The inheritance pattern of CPVT1 is autosomal dominant. CPVT2 is caused by mutation in the cal sequestrin 2 located on chromosome 1. Autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance has been noted with CPVT2. CPVT3 has been mapped to chromosome 7. It is an early onset lethal form of CPVT. Mutations have been documented in the TCRL gene. The gene responsible for CPVT4 is located on chromosome 1 and it is the CalModulin gene CALM1. It is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. CPVT5 is caused by triadin gene mutations located on chromosome 6. The disorder can occur with or without associated muscle weakness. CPVT5 is also transmitted in an autosomal recessive pattern. Triadin is a protein of the calcium release complex. CPVT is initiated by conditions which increase catecholamine levels like exercise, emotional stress or isoprotonol infusion. In its classical form, bidirectional ventricular tachycardia appears during exercise and disappears on rest in a rate dependent fashion. The onset is mostly in childhood and most cases respond to adequate doses of beta blockers which is the sheet anchor of therapy. Some cases which do not respond well to beta blockers may need implantation of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. But the ICD shock itself may trigger off an electrical storm due to the associated stress. Hence, patients implanted with an ICD should also be given beta blockers to prevent such episodes. Another option for reducing the number of shocks and the consequent electrical storms is programming a longer detection interval. This will avoid shocks being given for self-limited episodes of ventricular tachycardia but has the potential to delay treatment in case of ventricular fibrillation. Another reason proposed by proponents of longer detection interval is that the ventricular tachycardia in CPVT is initiated by triggered activity while ventricular fibrillation has a re-entrant mechanism
and may respond better to the shock. Estimated mortality of untreated cases ranges from 30 to 50 percent before the age of 20 to 30 years according to family studies. About 30 percent become symptomatic by the age of 10 and 80 percent by the age of 40 years according to one report. It may be noted that CPVT cannot be diagnosed by a resting ECG alone. Even though exercise testing is the most important investigation in a suspected CPVT, up to one-fifth of them may not develop ventricular ectopy during an exercise stress test. Sometimes CPVT may be misdiagnosed as long QT1 with a normal QT, which can occur in long QT1 during certain periods of time. But genetic testing is certainly useful in differentiating the two. A pediatric and congenital electrophysiology society multi-center retrospective cohort study of CPVT patients diagnosed before the age of 19 years and their first degree relatives has been published. Genetic testing was done in 194 of the 236 subjects in the study during a follow-up period ranging from 1.4 to 5.3 years. 60% had RYR2 associated CPVT1. CPVT2 due to homozygous CASQ2 mutation was found only in 4 patients. All had history of life-threatening symptoms. Another family potentially affected with heterozygous CPVT2 included 3 subjects of which the proband had life-threatening symptoms. Her relatives had exercise-induced ventricular bigeminy. An unusual point noted in the study was that in one quarter of the symptomatic patients, cardiac events were precipitated by only normal wakeful activities. Beta blocker is the single most effective therapy for recurrent VT unless the person is in shock. A combination of intravenous amiodron with oral propranolol has been found to be superior to intravenous amiodron with oral metoprolol. Stellate ganglion block or ablation is being increasingly used as a modality for treatment of drug refractory ventricular tachycardia. Temporary blockage of stellate ganglion can be obtained by injection of lignocaine or bupivacaine for a longer effect. Sometimes a cannula can be left in situ and a local anesthetic infusion started for prolonged effect. Ablation of stellate ganglion chemically with alcohol or surgically are feasible. Video assisted thoracoscopic surgery is a semi-invasive option which is replacing open surgery for surgical ablation of stellate ganglion. There should be a low threshold for inserting intraartic balloon pump in those with electrical storm. ECMO support is useful in pediatric cases as hemodynamic protection for aggressive antiarrhythmic medical treatment giving a survival of more than 80%. Moderate therapeutic hypothermia has been shown to suppress electrical storms in a person with multivessel coronary artery disease. The converse is that patients with fever may have worsening of electrical storms so the control of fever may be useful. Monomorphic ventricular premature complexes which trigger the ventricular fibrillation should be targeted during ablation of VF. The best time to take them up for EP study is during a storm as the tachycardia may not be inducible at other times. Marking electrode positions while taking ECG will help pace mapping at EP study to get an exact match. Excellent outcomes for catheter ablation with resolution of storm in over 90% of patients and a complication rate as low as 2% has been mentioned. Most ventricular tachycardias can be approached for catheter ablation endocardially, but there are few which needs an epicardial approach. VTs originating from the left ventricular outflow tract is likely to be epicardial 
and perivascular compared to the right ventricular outflow tract VTs. VTs in non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy and those in chagasic cardiomyopathy are likely to have epicardial origin. Among the ischemic VTs, those in the infralateral region can have an epicardial origin. Sometimes VTs in arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia can also be epicardial. When a previous attempt at endocardial ablation has failed, it is all the more reason to look for an epicardial focus. Other reasons for trying an epicardial approach are difficulty in accessing the left ventricular cavity as in the presence of thrombus or prosthetic valve. But epicardial route will not be useful for VTs which involve the subendocardium and Purkinje system as in fascicular VT, bundle branch reentrant VT or VT originating from the papillary muscle. An epicardial VT can be recognized by the slurred initial part of the QRS complex which resembles a delta wave. This occurs because of the slow transmural actuation from the epicardial focus to the endocardial surface. Conventionally, mapping and ablation of ventricular tachycardia is done from the endocardial aspect with ablation catheters within the heart. Sometimes the focus is sub-epicardially situated and needs epicardial ablation either through the coronary sinus or from the true epicardial aspect. Earlier approach to epicardial ablation was perioperative mapping and ablation using a thoracotomy. In 1996, Sosa and colleagues described percutaneous technique for pericardial puncture from the sub root and epicardial mapping. It can be done either under local anesthesia or general anesthesia. Initial attempts were to target sub-epicardial ventricular tachycardia circuits in Chagas disease. Later, the same group used the epicardial approach to treat ventricular tachycardia occurring late after myocardial infarction. The percutaneous pericardial puncture needle was same as that is being used for epidural anesthesia. It is introduced at an angle of 45 degrees towards the left scapula from the sub region under local anesthesia. It is gently advanced guided by fluoroscopy till it is close to the cardiac silhouette when a slight negative pressure is felt. Most often the region chosen is the medial third of the right ventricle noted on coronary angiography to be free of major vessels. Electrode catheters placed at the right ventricular apex and in the coronary sinus also serve as reference points while puncturing the pericardium. 2 ml of iodinated contrast is injected to confirm the intrapericardial position of the needle tip. If in the correct plane, the contrast collects around the cardiac silhouette. If outside, it collects in the mediastinum. Once the position is confirmed, a floppy tipped guide wire is introduced into the pericardial space. The wire should easily slip into the pericardial space without any resistance if it is in the right plane. Guide wire position is checked by fluoroscopy and an 8F introducer sheath is threaded over it. After this, a 4mm tipped ablation catheter is introduced and mapping done from various regions of interest depending on the clinical ventricular tachycardia. Epicardial approach has a higher risk of complications and hence is often considered only after an endocardial approach fails. Sometimes it is the first line approach when the ECG pattern or the underlying heart disease like dilated cardiomyopathy makes the possibility of epicardial circuits high. An intracardiac thrombus or prosthetic mechanical valves in aortic or mitral position may also mandate a primary epicardial approach. Mapping and ablation of ventricular tachycardia by the epicardial approach is considered in the following situations. 1. VT in structural heart diseases with a propensity for epicardial substrate like Chagas disease and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. 2. Hyperenhancement seen in the epicardial region on contrast enhanced cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. 3. Endocardial mapping fails to identify an endocardial scar. 4. Electrocardiographic features of clinical or induced VT indicating an epicardial focus. 5. Failed attempts at ablation by endocardial approach
are important indications for epicardial mapping. Here is an ECG showing ventricular tachycardia occurring during a treadmill exercise test. The initiating beat is a ventricular ectopic beat with R on T phenomenon. It is a monomorphic tachycardia with negative QRS in V1 and positive QRS in leads 2 and V5. This could be a tachycardia originating from the right ventricular outflow tract as it has an LBBB pattern and inferior axis. RVOT tachycardias are known to be induced by exercise. They can respond to beta blocker therapy and are also amenable for radio frequency catheter ablation. Some cases are resistant and can recur even after multiple ablations. Exercise induced ventricular tachycardia can also occur in catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and inherited arrhythmogenic disorder. But in CPVT, it is often a bidirectional ventricular tachycardia with alternating beats having opposite polarity. Exercise induced ventricular tachycardia has been reported in isolated left ventricular non compaction. This second ECG strip is the continuation of the first strip where the tachycardia breaks only to restart after two sinus beats. The exercise had been stopped soon after tachycardia was noted. Ventricular tachycardia during exercise could also be due to myocardial ischemia. Often the tachycardia subsides on stopping the exercise while an occasional person may need direct current cardioversion or pharmacological cardioversion. ECG tracing during recovery showing that the tachycardia has subsided but ventricular ectopics occurring in a trigeminal pattern with R on T phenomenon are seen. Cold ST segment elevation of 2 mm or more with negative T wave in right precordial leads V1 and V2 either spontaneously or after challenge with sodium channel blocker drug is the characteristic ECG finding in Brugada syndrome. Quinidine is a class 1 antiarrhythmic agent which can block transient outward and rapid component of delayed rectifier potassium currents. It has been shown to prevent phase 2 re-entry and ventricular fibrillation in experimental studies on Brugada syndrome. When VF was inducible at baseline electrophysiology studies, quinidine can render it non-inducible in 76 to 88% cases. Quinidine has been reported to be useful in pediatric patients as an alternative to ICD. It may be useful in the setting of arrhythmic storms and to reduce the number of ICD shocks. Belhassen and Associates prospectively evaluated 25 patients with Brugada syndrome, of which 7 were cardiac arrest survivors and 7 had unexplained syncope. In all 25 patients, VF could be induced at baseline EP study. 22 of the 25 were non-inducible while on quinidine. Long-term treatment ranging from 6 months to 219 months was given to 19 patients. None had arrhythmic events, though two had non-arrhythmia related syncope. Side effects occurred in 36%, which resolved on drug discontinuation. Side effects of quinidine like QT prolongation with potential for toss at the points, thrombocytopenia, diarrhea, esophagitis, allergic reactions, and aggravation of sinus node dysfunction must be kept in mind. Moreover, it is not freely available in all countries. Since quinidine is not freely available, people have used quinine, which is used as an anti-malarial drug. It was successful in controlling electrical storm in a 10-year-old child with Brugada syndrome. Intravenous quinine, a diastereomer of quinidine, was used in this case as quinidine was not available.
വി ടി ഇൻസ്ട്രക്ചറലി നോർമൽ ഹാർട്ട് കോൺസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട്സ് അബൌട്ട് ടെൻ പേഴ്സൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് പേഷ്യൻസ് വിത്ത് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ടാക്കി കാർഡിയ എക്കോ കാർഡിഗ്രാം ആൻഡ് കൊറോണറി ആൻജിയോഗ്രാംസ് ആൻഡ് നോർമൽ ഇൻ ദീസ് കേസസ് ബട്ട് എം ആർ ഐ മേ ഷോ സട്ടിൽ അബ്നോമാലിറ്റീസ് ലോക്കലൈസ് സിമ്പത്തറ്റിക് ഡീനോവേഷൻ മേ ബി സീൻ ഇൻ സം ഓഫ് ദം ബേസ് ലൈൻ ഇ സി ജി ഇസ് നോർമൽ ഇൻ മെനി സിറ്റുവേഷൻസ് ഫോളോയിങ് ആർ ദി മെയിൻ ടൈപ്സ് ഓഫ് വി ടി വിത്ത് സ്ട്രക്ചറലി നോർമൽ ഹാർട്ട് വൺ റൈറ്റ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ഔട്ട് ഫ്ലോ ട്രാക്ട് വി ടി ടു ലെഫ്റ്റ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ഔട്ട് ഫ്ലോ ട്രാക്ട് വി ടി ത്രീ ഇഡിയോപതിക് ലെഫ്റ്റ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ടാക്കി കാർഡിയ ഫോർ കാറ്റകോളമെനർജിക് പോളിമോർഫിക് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ടാക്കി കാർഡിയ ഫൈവ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ടാക്കി കാർഡിയ ഇൻ ബ്രുഗാഡ സിൻഡ്രോം സിക്സ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ടാക്കി കാർഡിയ ഇൻ ലോങ് ക്യൂട്ടി സിൻഡ്രോം ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് ത്രീ ആർ മോണോമോർഫിക് വി ടി വൈൽ ദ ലാറ്റർ ത്രീ ആർ പോളിമോർഫിക് ഇൻ നേച്ചർ വൈറ്റ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ ഔട്ട് ഫ്ലോ ട്രാക്ട് വി ടി ഇസ് എ വൈറ്റ് ക്യൂ ആർ എസ് ടാക്കി കാർഡിയ വിത്ത് എൽ ബി 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 പാറ്റേൺ ആൻഡ് ഇൻഫീരിയർ ആക്സസ് It occurs in 3rd to 5th decade and constitutes about 90% of outflow VTs. There are two types, non-sustained repetitive variety and paroxysmal exercise-induced sustained variety. Both are terminated by adenosine in contrast from VT in arithmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Exercise stress testing is used to initiate and evaluate RVOT VT. Initiation depends on a critical heart rate which differs in each patient. MRI may show abnormalities of right ventricle in up to 70%, which include focal thinning, diminished systolic wall thickening, and abnormal wall motion. Differential diagnosis of RVOT-VT include ARVD, Mahim fiber tachycardia, antidromic AVRT using a right-sided axillary pathway, and VT in patients after repair of tetralogy of fallow. Intracellular calcium overload is thought to be the mechanism which enhances function of sodium calcium exchanger thereby increasing inward sodium current and delayed after depolarization which initiate tachycardia cyclic amp regulates intracellular calcium increased levels of cyclic amp will increase intracellular calcium levels Adenosine acts by lowering cyclic AMP concentration. Beta blockers act by inhibiting adenylate cyclase which mediates the synthesis of cyclic AMP. Verapamil has its action by inhibiting L-type calcium channels. These are the mechanisms by which these drugs are effective in RVOTVT. RVOTVT occurring in repetitive runs having left bundle branch block morphology and inferior axis. RVOT tachycardia in children responsive to adenosine has been described. In these children, after termination of tachycardia with adenosine, verapamil was used effectively for prophylaxis against recurrence. Beta blockers, verapamil or diltiasm can control RVOT VT with about 25 to 50 percent efficacy. Class 1A, 1C, 3 including amiodron have been tried in the treatment of RVOT VT. Radio frequency catheter ablation has cure rates of 90% and is the preferable option given the young age of patients with RVOT VT. But some of the foci can have an origin very near the left main coronary artery and caution is needed while ablating this foci to prevent damage to the left main coronary artery. Simultaneous coronary angiography is needed to identify the relation of the mapping catheter to the left main in these situations. Left ventricular outflow tract VT is characterized by S waves in lead 1 and R wave transition in V1, V2 and constitutes about 10% of outflow VT. There are two varieties of LVOT VT, supravalvular and infravalvular. Absence of S wave in V5, V6 is suggestive of supravalvular origin while the presence of S wave in V5, V6 indicates infravalvular origin there is a risk of left main coronary artery occlusion while ablating lvot vt hence coronary angiography before during and after ablation is recommended the ablation catheter tip has to be kept 1 cm away from the ostia of the coronary arteries idiopathic left ventricular tachycardias are verapamil sensitive fascicular tachycardias three types are described RBBB left axis pattern originating from left posterior fascicle RBBB right axis pattern 
originating from left anterior fascicle and left fascicular tachycardia with normal axis. ILVT can be terminated with intravenous verapamil. Long term therapy with verapamil is also feasible. Radio frequency catheter ablation is highly effective in those with severe symptoms. Identifying the focus of ablation can be achieved by the recognition of Purkinje potential, late diastolic potential or earliest ventricular activation. Purkinje potentials are high frequency short duration potentials preceding the QRS complex. They are also called P potential and diastolic potential. Perkinia potentials can be recorded both in sinus rhythm and during VT. Pacing at sites of earliest P potential produces QRS identical to that of clinical tachycardia. They occur 30 to 40 milliseconds before the VT QRS complex. Primary ablation of ILVT has been suggested by some authors because fascicular VT is sometimes difficult to induce despite pharmacological provocation. Primary ablation has a higher success rate, lesser procedure time, lower fluoroscopy time and requires lesser number of RF energy deliveries. Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is a bidirectional polymorphic VT which is induced by exercise or catecholamine infusion. Family history of premature SCD and stress related syncope is obtained in about a third of patients. Exercise or acute emotion triggers the syncope in CPVT. Symptoms typically manifest in childhood. CPVT has a genetic basis with 5 genetic types described so far. Rhinoidian receptor 2 mutation is transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait, while Cal sequestrin mutation is transmitted as an autosomal recessive variety. These two are designated as CPVT1 and CPVT2. Three other genetic types, CPVT3, CPVT4 and CPVT5 have also been documented. CPVT has been discussed in detail in another video on this channel. Beta blockers are the preferred therapy in CPVT. ICD may be required in 30% of patients, but a word of caution is needed since there is a risk of electrical storm with ICD discharges which can cause an emotional stress and a vicious cycle of CPVT and shocks. Brugada syndrome is characterized by an apparent RBBB pattern with ST elevation in V1 to V3 associated with life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias, typically polymorphic VT. There is a tendency for familial occurrence and it is associated with SCN5A mutation and several other mutations. Loss of the action potential dome in the epicardium but not endocardium causes the right precordial ST elevation in Brugada syndrome. Implantation of a cardioverter defibrillator is the only effective treatment though quinidine has been suggested in addition. There are at least 16 genotypes of long QT syndrome LQT1 to LQT3 as per OMIM database. Phenotypically, LQT1 has broad-based T waves with indistinct onset while LQT2 has bifid T waves and LQT3 a long isoelectric ST segment. First and foremost in the treatment of long QT syndrome is the exclusion of acquired LQTS which is much more common. Avoidance of QT prolonging drugs is essential. Beta blockers are the most useful therapy in LQTS. ICD placement along with beta blocker therapy is the best option for secondary prevention in a case of long QT syndrome with history of arrhythmic syncope. Sodium channel blocking drugs like ranolazine, maxillotine and flecainide have been used in the treatment of LQT3 which is due to sodium channel SCN5A mutation. A sub-study of the defibrillation in acute myocardial infarction trial evaluated why an ICD is not useful soon after a myocardial infarction.
Dynamic study had randomized those with recent myocardial infarction after 6 to 40 days, left ventricular dysfunction and a low heart rate variability to receive an ICD or just standard medical therapy involving 653 patients. It was a negative study in that ICD therapy failed to improve survival. The sub-study concluded that ICDs do not reduce all-cause mortality in those with a recent myocardial infarction. This was because those who get an arrhythmic death averted by an ICD have a high ischemic burden and heart failure risk. This leads to a higher mortality in the subsequent weeks or months. On the other hand, the lower risk group have less chance of ICD shocks as well as subsequent mortality. There was also a higher proportion of ventricular fibrillation of 38% rather than ventricular tachycardia among the causes for appropriate ICD discharges compared to other primary prevention trials. This may also be a marker of higher mortality risk. The study was not able to identify whether the arrhythmia needing the ICD shock caused deterioration of cardiac function or an additional factor caused both together. It could also not show whether the shock itself directly or indirectly led to higher mortality. This was because the small number of deaths in subgroups limited the role of any such analysis. This study also highlights the fact that ICD therapy may not always mean averting a death. A competing risks analysis showed that those factors which increase the risk of arrhythmic death also increase the risk of non-arrhythmic deaths. Reduction in sudden cardiac death by the implantable defibrillator was fully offset by an increase in non-arrhythmic deaths which were greatest in patients receiving defibrillator shocks. The IRIS study also showed that prophylactic ICD therapy did not reduce overall mortality among patients with acute myocardial infarction and clinical high-risk features. Study enrolled 898 patients 5 to 31 days after myocardial infarction if they had left ventricular ejection fraction 40% or less and heart rate 90 beats or more on first available ECG and or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia at 150 beats per minute or more during Holter monitoring. How to cover the arrhythmic risk in post myocardial infarction patients before they qualify for guideline recommended ICD therapy? An option is to bridge with a wearable defibrillator cardioverter or WCD. West investigators randomly assigned 2,302 patients with acute myocardial infarction and ejection fraction 35% or less in a 2 is to 1 ratio to receive WCD plus guideline directed therapy or to guideline directed therapy only. WCD did not significantly lower the primary outcome of arrhythmic death than control. But a major problem regarding WCD is the compliance. Of the 48 participants in the device group who died, only 12 were wearing the device at the time of death. J point is the end of the QRS complex marking the end of ventricular depolarization and the junction between depolarization and repolarization. J wave is a deflection with a dome or hump in the same direction as the R wave. Classically, a wave at the J point occurring in hypothermia has been called Osborne wave after the seminal work of John J. Osborne. Important J-wave syndromes are Early Repolarization Syndrome and Brigada Syndrome. Early Repolarization Syndrome was initially considered as a benign condition till Isagre and Associates highlighted the relation between sudden cardiac arrest and early repolarization. They defined early repolarization as an elevation of QR's ST junction of at least 0.1 mV from baseline in inferior or lateral leads manifested as QRS slurring or notching.
they compared 206 subjects resuscitated after sudden cardiac arrest due to idiopathic ventricular fibrillation and 412 subjects without heart disease who were matched for age, gender, race and level of physical activity. Early repolarization was noted in 31% of those with idiopathic ventricular fibrillation while it was seen in only 5% of the controls. During a mean follow-up period of 61 months, monitoring with implantable defibrillator showed higher incidence of recurrent ventricular fibrillation in those with a repolarization abnormality. Anselewitz and colleagues divided early repolarization syndrome into three types. Type 1 was early repolarization pattern predominantly in lateral leads prevalent in healthy male athletes. Type 2 was predominantly in the inferior and infralateral leads and associated with a higher level of risk. Type 3 displayed early repolarization pattern globally in inferior lateral and right precordial leads and was associated with highest level of risk for development of malignant arrhythmias and ventricular fibrillation storms. J-wave is mediated by the transient outward potassium current ITO. It has been suggested that arrhythmias associated with early repolarization, Brugada syndrome, hypothermia and those occurring in the acute phase of ST elevation myocardial infarction are linked to abnormalities in ITO mediated J-wave. ECG showing concave upward ST segment elevation with a notch at the end of the QRS complex or a slurring of the terminal QRS seen in lateral leads is characteristic of early repolarization syndrome. J waves have been marked by red arrows. In an article by Frederick Sasher and Michael Heisagre in BMH Medical Journal, they highlighted on the need for specific definition for ERPS. They also mentioned that having an ERPS pattern is not a disease by itself. But it is crucial to give importance when there is a family history of sudden cardiac death and in patients with syncope having dramatic J-point elevation and a descending bar horizontal ST segment. They mentioned that even though 5% of Caucasian population may have this ECG pattern, only 1 in 2500 are at risk of ventricular fibrillation. Here is another ECG with early repolarization syndrome as evidenced by the concave upward ST segment elevation in leads V2 to V6. J waves have been marked by blue arrows.